welcome. I think everyone or most people in this room know me, um, but just in case you don't, my name is Rebecca Dielschneider. I'm an associate professor here in the area of biological and health sciences, and it's just my joy to welcome you here today. Providence is pleased to host this lecture. Providence University College and Theological Seminary, as you probably already know, is a Christian academic community in the evangelical tradition that teaches people to grow in knowledge and character for leadership and service. We are approaching our 100th, 100th anniversary very soon. So if you're not already tuned in to follow Providence, please do, because you will want to celebrate that big milestone with us. Providence carries out its activities as an educational institution on the traditional territories of the Cree, Anishinaabe, and Métis nations. We honor them as the ancient peoples and current hosts of this part of God's creation. The Rosa River First Nation community are our nearest relatives to these people. We live together according to Treaty 1, signed in 1871. We seek to understand Indigenous perspectives and the story of the land on which our campus rests. I invite us to take a moment to just pause and reflect on this, especially given the topic of today's lecture. Let us acknowledge that the land, electricity, water, and more that we enjoy here in Manitoba has largely come about due to forced relocations and discrimination against these Indigenous peoples. At the hand of settler governments and Christian churches, Indigenous peoples have suffered and still face significant challenges, one of which is addiction, which we will hear a little bit more about today. This lecture is part of the past president lecture series of the Canadian Scientific and Christian Affiliation, or the CSCA. This affiliation, which you've maybe seen a little bit about the pamphlets as you came in, is a fellowship of scientists, people like myself and others, and those interested in science who want to understand how science and faith can best interact. The CSCA is committed to providing an open, respectful, and welcoming form. You can see that for yourself because we have an exciting annual meeting coming up with our umbrella organization, the American Scientific Affiliation, or the ASA. And this meeting is not too far from us, so just over uh, in Toronto at the end of July. I'll be there, and maybe that interests you as well. This particular group has been um, a big blessing to me over the years. So I invite you to learn a little bit more. Grab a pamphlet at the back and a pen, or you can go to csca.ca and sign up to hear a little bit more about upcoming events and you can follow us on social media. So lastly, and importantly, let me introduce our guest speaker of today. Dr. Janet Warren earned a Bachelor of Science in Psychology from McMaster, a Doctor of Medicine from the University of Toronto, and a Master's in Theological Studies from Tyndale, and a PhD in theology from the University of Birmingham. She currently lives in Hamilton, Ontario, where she works part-time as a family physician and part-time as an independent scholar in theology. Her medical practice has included extensive experience in mental health care and psychotherapy. She teaches and researches in various fields of psychology and theology and their intersection. She's published four books, and I'll highlight two on this slide here. Recently published All Things Wise and Wonderful, a Christian understanding of how and why things happen. And she edited a collection of essays entitled Singing into Splintered Spaces, the Rhythms of Mission and Spiritual Discipline. Dr. Warren was a past president of the CICA, which makes sense given this past president lecture series. So she was a past president from 2016 to 2020. So we are so fortunate to have Dr. Janet Warren here with us. Please join me in welcoming her. Thank you, Rebecca, and uh, thank you to Providence as well for hosting this lecture. So uh, Paul writes uh, in Romans 7, 18, 19, and this is the paraphrase from the message. The power of sin within me keeps sabotaging my best intentions. I obviously need help. I realize that I don't have what it takes. I can will it, but I can't do it. I decide to do good, but I don't really do it. I decide not to do bad, but then I do it anyway. My decisions, such as they are, don't result in actions. Something has gone wrong deep within me and gets the better of me every time. <laughs> 
It happens so regularly that it's predictable. The moment I decide to do good, sin is there to trip me up. I truly delight in God's commands, but it's pretty obvious that not all of me joins in that delight. Parts of me covertly rebel. And just when I least expected, they take charge. So I hear the story or various versions of it, usually at least once a week. Um, My uh, medical practice is at a community health center where we deal with marginalized populations. A lot of people struggle with homelessness, addiction, et cetera. And I also hear it in my uh, private counseling practice. usually without the word sin used. But notice that when Paul uses the word sin, he implies that it's this mysterious external thing, something bigger than him. So I, in, sadly, in today's society, I don't need to tell people a lot about what addictions are. Um, we watch the news every day and you hear about the opioid crisis uh, in North America, well, in the, the world. Um, and, um, but less often talked about, even in churches, but equally common is sin. Um, Both are universal and both are very complex. There's lots of commonalities, especially denial, self-deception, and both of them have roots in discomfort, which of course leads to avoidance. Um, So I believe uh, strongly, as uh, Rebecca said, I've uh, learned from the CSA, I believe strongly in the integration of science and faith that the two disciplines can inform each other. So that's what we're going to talk about today and how um, our scientific and psychological knowledge about addiction can inform our knowledge of sin and vice versa. Uh, So addictions, as I mentioned, are common, but usually we just think about the extremes like opioids, drugs, alcohol, et cetera. Um, and, uh, but I think it's helpful to view it very broadly, various types. Some people may recognize uh, that they're glued to their cell phones, um, <laughs> Facebook, uh, <laughs> coffee, et cetera. Um, so I think it's helpful, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, but to, to view it broadly. So it's not just something that happens to those druggies out there or to those cell celebrities who go into their, you know, expensive rehabs, etc. Spans all ages, all cultures, all social classes, multiple psychological, relational, spiritual, societal influences and consequences. Um, And although the term is relatively new, the concept um, has actually been around since humans have been around. And some of you may be familiar with biblical uh, passages um, about not having excess uh, um, alcohol. Multiple questions about the nature of addictions. Uh, So it's not just the simple dichotomy of bad behavior or a choice. Um, not just about, oh, I can't help it, I'm a helpless victim, or about, oh, well, they should just quit and, and choose, uh, etc. Um, so, is some of the questions that uh, come about then, is it, it and as I guess I already it's implied in the, the slides and I already gave it away that it's not this simple dichotomy of an either or. So it's not like, like people are either victims or sinners. It's not like it's an illness or a symptom of illness. It's this complex mix of all of these things. And I'll apologize in advance if I overuse the word complex, um, but <laughs> because of the complexities, the definitions are not easy. Um, many different ways of viewing it. So the American Society of Addiction Medicine talks about it being a chronic disease related to brain reward, motivation, um, and related circuitry with psychological, social, and spiritual manifestations uh, that result in individuals pathologically pursuing reward and or relief by substance use and other behaviors. So it's interesting that even though they talk about it being a chronic disease, uh, this very medical type model does acknowledge that there are psychological, social factors, etc. Um, some of you may be familiar with Gabor Mate, who's a well-known physician who works in the East End of Vancouver, high um, uh, 
high risk area for addiction, etc. And uh, he emphasizes more the behavioral aspect of addictions and talking about it being a repeated behaviors, uh, which may or may not be related to substance use, in which the person feels compelled to persist uh, regardless of any possible negative impact. Um, Gerald May, uh, who writes more from a theological perspective and, and psychological, talks about it more being a state. So we've got this, you know, disease, behavior, state, and he says it's a state of compulsion, obsessive obsession, preoccupation that enslaves a person's will and desire. So that concept of enslavement we already came across in, in Paul's writing to Romans. Although I think the message translated it differently. Um, generally speaking, we can talk about the two broad types of addiction. So the substance or chemical addictions, if you like, or the behavioral ones. Um, as I mentioned, I'm going to view them broadly. We're probably a little bit more of a focus on behavioral ones, but just briefly in terms of symptoms, um, some of the physiological uh, components of substance or chemical addictions, including tolerance, which is needing increasing amounts to get the same effect, and withdrawal, developing unpleasant symptoms that are relieved by taking more of the sub substance. And even though these primarily apply to substance or chemical addictions, uh, they can have parallels in behavioral addictions as well. Um, from a psychological uh, perspective, um, addictions can, can be all-consuming and they can involve an obsession. So alcoholics talk about thinking, drinking. So until they have the next drink, that's all they think about. Self-preoccupation, it's all about you know, when they're going to get, get their next fix, so to speak. This continual ambivalence, so this conflict between desire, wanting something, and aversion, not wanting it, realizing that it, it's going to be harmful. And helplessness, very common feeling. Um, people are, who struggle with addictions are often impulsive, impatient, have a tendency towards negative or concrete thinking. And of course, some of this can be a circular because some people who are impulsive and impatient are more prone to um, struggling with addiction. Um, addiction is typically associated with low self-esteem, um, attachment issues, relationship issues. Um, the consequences would be poor social supports, employment problems, um, other mental health conditions. And again, it can be the chicken egg thing. Um, history of childhood trauma is present in up to 65% of those with chemical addictions. My um, counseling uh, specialty, if you like, I don't know if that's the right word, but is, is trauma counseling. Um, so uh, I, I do tend to have a little bit of a bias in that regard, I must say, in terms of seeing almost everything as a response to trauma. Um, so perhaps um, because of the cognitive dissonance associated with self-destructive behavior, and for those of you who don't know what cognitive dissonance is, it's this disconnect between what you want to do and what you don't want to do or what your behavior doesn't match with what you really want to be doing. And so because of that, there's a lot of um, um, denial, repression, um, rationalization, secrecy, et cetera, um, a lot of dishonesty. So people will say, oh, I have nothing in common with, you know, that street person who's addicted. Um, oh, I can stop anytime. No one else thinks I have a problem. Um, so it's this, this uh, ambivalence, et cetera, is often described as a cycle of addiction. Um, so <clears throat> this particular slide re relates to alcoholism, but it can be applied to a whole lot of things. So the, the, the feelings of, um, uh, you know, the guilt and shame and, okay, I won't do it again. Then the pain, the anxiety. And because nobody likes those feelings, they want to then relieve it, which then, of course, leads to the obsession, thinking about drinking, then the actual drinking, the losing control, and the cycle repeats. And this is another version um, that I, I think was actually used to describe uh, anger. So, again, it's that acting out, which leads to temporary relief, but then leads to some consequences, feelings of guilt, pain, etc., and the cycle repeats. So, how are we to understand addiction? I think it's important to understand that, um, and, and uh, this was actually the book I, I wrote about the um, during and and uh, the pand and about understanding the pandemic, is that how we understand the cause of something determines our response. 
So if we see substance abuse addiction as a disease, then the treatment would be 100% medical. If we see it as a choice, then the response should be punishment or remediation. If we see it as a sin, then the response would be repentance. Um, so many different ways of understanding. The medical model um, is probably the most prevalent. So this idea of it being a neurochemical problem, chronic disease. Um, and yeah, there is uh, <clears throat> definitely genetic evidence, etc. However, many limits to the medical model. So the obvious one that um, I'm sure Rebecca and a few of you would teach that correlation is not the same as causation. <laughs> so just because addiction is associated with a lot of uh, these uh, problems, including uh, some of the physiological ones, does not mean that those have caused the problem. So it's better to think in terms of genetic predisposition. And in fact, genetic science is, is not exact despite what some people would have us believe. It's not an exact science. Um, the relatively new field of epigenetics tells us how genes can be expressed, can change. Um, multiple... Um, multiple different factors. We know the brain can change, which is exciting, which those of us who practice counseling have known long before some of the neuroscience um, evidence has come out, but the brain can change. Interestingly, addiction is the only disease that can be treated by group support meetings. And unlike other chronic conditions, epidemiological studies that show that most addicts actually recover by their late 20s. Um, there's inherent paradoxes in the addiction discourse. So someone can decide not to compulsively use a drug, right? Um, AA members, uh, one of the first things they admit is they are powerless, but yet they gain control over their drinking through the program. Causes, as I've already mentioned, multifactorial, uh, include biology, psychology, sociology, et cetera. Not completely understood. Um, <laughs> especially the effects of um, predispositions and the effects of, of experience. So not every child who grows up with, a, with trauma develops addictions. Um, not everyone who grows up in an alcoholic family develops addictions. Um, so it's, it's uh, yeah, intertwining of multiple different factors. And I would see it as both a disease and a choice. Um, and so looking at the concept of choice, um, again, not simple. Uh, we can think about uh, short-term versus long-term choices, for example, or you may have heard the cliche of short-term gain versus long-term pain. Um, uh, voluntary behavior has a biological basis, but it's also governed by feasibility, consequences, costs, and benefits. Our choices are very much dependent on our context. So you could talk about that, um, uh, and this is uh, from Kent Dunning, Dunnington, who's a, um, a Christian psychologist who's done a lot of work on, on addiction. Um, and so he says it's more of what something we become rather than something we have or something we are. The problem with our choices is they can impede our freedom. So as uh, addicts well know, taking that, that slippery slope, right? So taking the, the first drink then becomes more difficult to resist the second drink and the third, and the third, et cetera. So the choice at each stage is not the same. So in the end, our choices can actually impede our freedom. Um, it, uh, Gerald May talks about, um, oh, actually, before that, sorry, um, Gabor Maté, again, talks about the, that these choices occur within this context, and the context is determined by brain functioning. And I, I would say that it's, again, this cyclical, circular um, issue. Um, so I think it's helpful to think a bit more on the spectrum you know, in some cases, maybe the choice is more prominent. In other cases, maybe the biological factor is a little bit more prominent um, and can take on a life of its own. I've had, had a, a patient with a, a eating food issues and telling her that my food consumes me. I thought that was very insightful. Um, so, uh, and uh, Gerald May talks about how um, it, it's, 
not this us versus them thing. It's not this, well, some people have a disease, some people make bad choices. Um, but in fact, addicted people make, make more obvious something that all of us experience. So we've already hinted at some of the commonalities between sin and addiction, and some of them I think have been implicit as well. But before we talk more about sin, I think it's helpful to us look at common underlying factor. And I think one of the terms that is helpful in this is the German term angst, which is depicted in these little cartoons. <clears throat> so this implies um, sort of feelings of discomfort, tension, emptiness, fear. It's usually unfocused, usually has an existential nature. So this is different from what we would call like clinical or even situational anxiety. It's this just underlying thing. Um, in fact, it's been shown that uh, some degree of discomfort angst, if you like, is beneficial, can increase success and resilience. Um, the classic uh, study from ooh, the early 20th century, I think, the yerkes dodson um, equation, some of you might be familiar with, showed that selective intention increases with increasing stress, but only up to a certain point, because after that, anxiety actually erodes performance. Um, Christian spirituality talks about the benefits of the dark night of the soul. So the benefits of growing spirituality through staying with some of that discomfort. Um, and Augustine's uh, classic line about our hearts being restless until they rest in you. Linda Mercadanti is also written from a Christian perspective about um, addiction. Um, and she points out that restlessness is God-given and it helps us to prevent uh, lives of uh, sort of shallow contentment. Um, so angst is more like this concept, and uh, I've already mentioned, of existential anxiety. So this was, I believe, first introduced by a, a Danish philosopher, uh, Søren Kierkegaard, and he says it's it's present at the beginning of creation in a way, um, and in it's universal. So it's the psychological or even an ontological, like part of our very nature, our beings as humans, state of simultaneous attraction and repulsion to future possibilities. And he gives an example of a man standing at the top of a cliff who's simultaneously afraid of falling and strangely tempted to jump. He talks about this, the dizziness of freedom. Um, and he says this tension relates to choice between self-destructive or self-actualizing behaviors, or from a Christian perspective, this choice to obey or disobey God. Important note that angst itself is not a sin, but it's a precondition for sin. Um, theologian uh, Reinhold Niebuhr has further developed this uh, so-called existential anxiety thesis. And he says that anxiety develops as a result of the tension between the limitations of our creatureliness and our spiritual ability to transcend and reflect on it. We're free but finite beings, and we're born into conditions that incite discomfort. Anxiety relates to temptation, and it's the inevitable result of the paradox of freedom and finitude and reflects the frailty of human life. So in sum, there is a God, it's not me. So we're free but finite beings and we're born into these conditions that incite discomfort. And anxiety relates to temptation, obviously, but it's the in inevitable result of this, this paradox. Um, most people, as I mentioned, dislike discomfort and therefore choose to avoid it. Uh, this can take many forms. Um, well, I, I didn't mention the the obvious uh, illustration there, um, <laughs> um, but uh, it talked about in, in the, the being present in the first humans. Uh, and part of their temptation was because they could recognize their humanity, but they also knew that there was a God and that tension being able to see beyond themselves, but being limited by themselves. Um, so avoiding uh, do I have this in a slide? Yep. <laughs> uh, uh, many forms that we, we can choose to avoid our uh, discomfort, chronic unhappiness, uh, relationship difficulties, uh, withdrawal, hiding, running away, anger, 
addiction, uh, perfectionism. So there can sometimes there'll be a fine line between so-called sort of normal angst and abnormal angst. Um, and people experience emotions differently. So at, there are certainly times where avoiding extreme emotional pain may be appropriate. Um, and again, just to reiterate, I'm using this concept or sort of conceptually as opposed to clinically. So, oh, there's some more um, ways that we run away. If you can you know, read the many faces of a people pleaser that are all the same, whether they are bored or depressed or angry. So, this idea of running away, as we saw with Adam and Eve, etc., is also theologically, biblically labeled sin. Um, and uh, even though the term is unpopular, I think the concept is very helpful. Similar characteristics to addiction involves self-deception, involves ambivalence, basically seeking comfort apart from God. So as uh, we know classically from Psalm 51, all sin is against God, ultimately. Interestingly, AA, although it started out in, as more with Christian roots, it no longer uses sin language, but the concepts of repentance, restitution, forgiveness are implicit in many of their treatment approaches. And this rich theolo theological doctrine of sin, and, and not just looking at it as a moralistic judgment, I think is a helpful alternative to a disease model of addiction. It's a ubiquitous phenomena, but it's not a unidimensional concept. Multiple images in the Bible and our one English term doesn't do justice to the multiple Hebrew and Greek concepts. So there's images of deceitfulness, lawlessness, crookedness, rebellion, missing the mark, failure, ignorance, perversion. From a theological, and, and uh, there's a, a, a lot in um, Proverbs um, about uh, people rejoicing in the evil, the wicked, etc. And then, of course, Paul teaches a lot about against sin. From a theological perspective, historically, uh, pride has, sin has been viewed pr primarily as a problem of pride. So deliberate violation of God's law, um, self-exaltation, thinking ourselves above God, basically. Um, which when you think about the existential anxiety, one of the ways to resolve it would be to think ourselves above God, right? So then we don't have this gap between there's a God, it's not me. Um, so it's, it's exceeding an upper boundary that, that God gives us. The problem with this um, concept of sin as pride is it neglects a lot of the biblical conceptions like inadequacy, failure, ignorance, missing the mark, which is one of the commonest terms. So those terms suggest that people actually fail to reach a lower boundary. They don't exceed an upper one, fail to uh, reach a lower one. Um, and this uh, uh, was brought to uh, attention theologically by feminist theologians who noticed that the, the sin of missing the mark is more common in women versus pride being more common in men. And they talk about sort of feminine sin versus masculine sin. So women are more prone to putting themselves down, self-abnegation, uh, sloth, not becoming uh, all they are, uh, are called to be. Um, Roman Catholic theologian Henry Nouwen talks about, and, and without referencing feminine masculine sin, he thinks that the biggest temptation common to humanity is not money, sex, or power, but self-rejection, um, a fear of never being good enough. And those of us who practice counseling, I think, will attest to that being a much more common practice. Now, of course, we could say the people who struggle with pride are not going to come to counseling in the first place, but... Um, Commonality. So, so those, those, that sort of idea of feminine, masculine sin are the two different types, I think is a helpful conception, but basically they still both have mistrust of God at their root. Um, 
And remember that that sin is not is a result of human freedom. We have the choice to turn towards or away from God. So it's not a, necessarily a biological inevitability. Um, I would say that pride and self-contempt can be seen as two sides of the same coin. And in fact, people can sometimes be unconsciously proud of being humble um, or those long-suffering, having low self-worth. And some of us may have seen this in people at church who, oh, don't mind me. I'll just, you know, I'll clean up. I'll do all this. And um, so, you know, without quite saying it, I'm the most humble Christian there is. Um, so these it's sinful responses to this angst can be moving against so that or acting superior to so that would be the the pride the domination type thing um or arrogance narcissism moving towards others um and that would be probably more common in women so the self-effacement but it can also be dependency um idleness and then the third way could be through avoiding others or moving towards objects. So that would be self-absorption, um, hiding, not engaging with people, avoiding relationships. Um, and of course, addiction would be another way of it as well. Um, uh, Terry Cooper, who writes about sin, pride and self-esteem, I believe is the name of his book, I recommend. Um, and he, he again, this talks about this concept of existential anxiety and how uh, the temptation is to uh, deny our creatureliness and deny our dependence on God. So we already talked about the cycle of addiction. Guess what? There's a cycle of sin as well. Sin can take on a life of its own. And uh, multiple biblical texts about the enslaving nature of sin. So sin leads to more sin. Um, and it's not always conscious, not always deliberate or logical. Sometimes sin becomes this larger than life thing. Um, and uh, Paul talks about this a fair bit. Uh, well, James too, sin when it is full grown. So he's almost talking about, you know, pers personifying sin. Um, you're slaves of the one you obey. So this is saying you know, this is a lot more than it just being a choice of just bad behavior. Um, Mark Biddle, who's done a, a biblical theology on sin, which I also recommend, describes it as an organic continuum that can twist and pervert reality. Um, Serene Jones, who's a feminist theologian, says that sin is both something we do and something that happens to us, something we consciously enact, and also a part of a social reality that we do not desire. Um, many of you are probably familiar with C.S. Lewis's work, and he talks specifically about people become the choices they make, and eventually their choices, in a sense, choose them. So we lose control through our um, thwarted attempts to gain control. There's that paradox. And in fact, the more we try and avoid our angst, the more it increases. Um, Self-deception, -de which we already talked about being very common in addiction, is an important facet of sin. It includes denial, minimization. Um, and again, I, I love the story of Adam and Eve. You know, they uh, even blamed God, you know, this classic triangulation type thing. Well, the woman you put here with me, so it's both God and the woman, let's just cover our bases here. <laughs> um, so this rationalization. And this problem with self, one of the many problems with self-deception, not only is it sinful, but it leads to um, overconfidence. And it leads to us having an un inaccurate uh, view of reality, which then results in suboptimal functioning. So to summarize some of the commonalities between sin and addiction, sin intertwines with angst, avoidance, addiction, um, angst inherent to the human condition, as we talked about, and attempts to avoid it, which often involve self-deception are common. Addiction be can be viewed as a way to avoid emotional pain. And although it may start this way, it easily spirals out of control and res restricts subsequent choices. So both sin and addiction are very common, complex, this tangled mass of predisposition and willful choice, um, both characterized by ambivalence, avoidance, self-deception, helplessness, self-preoccupation. Both exist in gradations of severity. 
Both are counterfeit means to avoid or to ease psychological distress. Both are influenced by the sin of others. Um, and that's what we've been talking about lately with the whole societal factors um, in sin. And I don't think we can 100% blame drug companies, but they are definitely a factor, for example. So both can become larger than life and feedback negatively on prior behavior. Both involve elements of vulnerability and responsibility, both compulsion and volition, both disease and choice. Interestingly, the language of sin is similar to the language of addiction. Both are sinister, systemic, and sometimes objectified. The Latin term for um, from which the English word derives uh, addiction derives is adesia, which means can mean bound to or enslaved by. The paradoxes: addicts often deny um, their uh, their problems, but addiction also develops as a way to deny other problems. Um, withdrawal from addictive substances commonly leads to anxiety, but many substances then provide a relief for anxiety. And so self-medication can very quickly become toxic. Um, the prevalence of childhood trauma in those with addiction suggests an element of victimization, of being sinned against in addiction. But there are differences. Um, sometimes, uh, sometimes sin is simple rebellion. Sometimes addiction is more disease than, uh, than choice. Um, yeah, uh, some, not everyone who uses an addictive substance becomes addicted. Um, so there's, is, there are exceptions. Um, so in terms of the intertwining, some helpful quotes, and uh, interestingly, the first two are not from particularly Christian perspectives, um, but again, you can see echoes of Christian theology in them. Um, so uh, Gostinik and his colleagues talk about people who've been traumatized repeating the trauma. Uh, Mate talks about this idea of a flight from distress or emotional anesthesia. Dunnington notes that um, addictions are become merely substitutes that we use to alleviate this uh, anxiety, restlessness, boredom, etc. And he calls them a potent form of idolatry. Uh, Gerald May says we all long for fulfillment. We all hunger for love. We have this inborn desire for God. And we seek to satiate this hunger, but often unsatisfactorily, because our desires bond to things and behaviors, and we become obsessed with these objects of attachment, idolizing them. And he quotes a friend um, who struggled um, and stating, "When I and I think this it's a, the opposite sort of perspective, but it is helpful for us to understand. When I feel very, very good, I start to marvel at the wonder of being alive, and then I become frightened." The more I feel the beauty of being here on this earth, the more I realize how fragile life is. When I've got problems or distractions or something to struggle with, I feel much better because then at least I know who I am and what I need to do. Um, so that's from his, uh, his the book I've been mostly quoting from his Addiction and Grace. This is from his other one, Will and Spirit. Um, but that gives you that, that idea, and some of us may have experienced, it's a, a good description of this existential anxiety. Um, once again, sin and addiction are not black and white concepts. So this uh, disease, vulnerability and responsibility, they have similar characteristics and roots and important differences. We know that all have sinned and fall short of the, the glory of God, but not everyone has an addiction. Um, addiction, because it involves uh, uh, observable behavior, is also more amenable to scientific study than sin is, for example. Um, Occasions, as I mentioned, where addiction might be um, understood better through a medical model. Times where the term angst may not always be helpful. But nevertheless, overall, I think understanding some aspects of addiction can help us understand the theological concept of sin. And understanding sin and its concomitant grace, of course, may help us heal addictions. Or at least have an approach to it. So let's talk about antidotes. Mm -hmm.
Now, we don't all have to be professional to, <laughs> to deal with people who struggle with addictions, including ourselves. Um, and we don't even have to label things as an addiction or label them as sin. But understanding these concepts can uh, help us to have compassion and have more compassion after that. So first of all, awareness is always helpful. This tangled mess of predisposition, predisposition and willful choice, this idea of universal angst that we try and escape and that we're all prone to addiction in some form to varying degrees. Awareness of understanding some of the roots of somebody's behavior, understanding where they, what it is they're running away from, what's their underlying pain. Having a short versus long-term perspectives and choice, understanding the consequences of repeated choices. Humility is always helpful. It's not about them versus us. There's not this huge gap. gap. Um, in fact, uh, Kent Dunnington uh, it calls the addict as being an unwitting prophet, and he writes, the prevalence and power of addiction indicates the extent to which a society fails to provide non-addictive models of acquiring certain kinds of goods necessary to human welfare. So that's a call to the church to have be a better place um, where people can find what they, they're looking for. Um, so this idea that addiction is only an extreme example of what is common to all human experience. From a counseling perspective, um, exposing avoid, and again, not necessarily even professional, but exposing avoidance strategies, uncovering emotional pain, learning to embrace discomfort, cultivating ambiguity. Uh, I think we need to hear more from our pulpits about that we don't have all the answers, that life is often difficult, that there's a lot of gray, and sometimes we need to live with tension. Um, directing people to the healing from the great physician. Gerald May talks about being present to the mystery in a gentle, open-handed, and cooperative way. And he writes that willfulness must give way to willingness and surrender. Mastery must yield to mystery. But we need to understand that freedom can be scary. As a community of Christ, as I mentioned, we need to be, perhaps teach more about discomfort and mystery, difficulties with freedom, daily surrender, take up your cross daily and follow me, divine compassion and healing, grace, of course, and mercy. Gerald May again, the dynamic outpouring of God's loving nature that flows into and through creation in an endless self-offering of healing, love, illumination, and reconciliation. It's often been noted that uh, AA is better at community than churches. Um, and part of that is because everyone in AA admits that they're addicts. Um, how often do we call our churches a community of repentant sinners? Um, <laughs> so, uh, but in general, this idea of a loving, caring community that offers hospitality to all can help oppose the, the pain, the fears, uh, the, the, and the isolation common to both addiction and sin. And I welcome questions, comments. Please join me in thanking Dr. Murray. I was having formulating one question in my mind. And there are so many truths that you spoke that I think really resonated with me. And I think especially the comparison between addiction and sin is really fruitful because as you said, it closes the gap, helps us as sinners realize we're not that different. And there can be room for more compassion. You shared a fabulous quote about an addict as an unwilling prophet. And I thought that was just so beautifully said and beautifully shared. Um, and I think you highlighted something about how they can help us see our social deficits or the services or supports we're missing. And I'm wondering if you can expand on that a little bit. And um, right. So, so the failure of society. So, uh, the, the the problem with addiction and people suffering shows that they, they're missing something, right? They're turning, they, they don't have alternatives. So they, uh, they, they do, but perhaps they're not clear. And it, the, whereas the 
quick instant reliefs to pain, such as with substance addiction and all sorts of other addictions. Um, and I didn't even comment, but particularly in our high tech age, social media, et cetera, um, where it's so quick and easy. So if society is not providing healthy, helpful alternatives to that, and by society, I think you know, we can say, including the church, um, that's a problem. So that's why the addict is a prophet, because they, they're showing us and revealing what the problem is. Mm -hmm. And I think in a church, in a religious setting, we view prophets as high, right? As, as mighty, as messengers. And I think seeing an addict like that is just a, a beautiful way to live. Mm -hmm. I think that I, I really, I really enjoyed this presentation, and I think it's very useful for us, especially the kinds of things as, as you presented the, the complexities between sin and addiction, and and the way that you've presented this. Of course, we all have sin, and we probably all have addiction. It's just all sort of mixed up together. One of the things I think that we, as as, as Christians, and certainly within the evangelical traditions, we are we are told to count our sins. Our addictions, we can, well, we can go to God with our addictions, but we could also go to the, to the medical community and, and all of the helps that mm -hmm. there might be. But God will take care of the sins. I think one thing that, that some other faith traditions might bring to the table is the definition of sin. So there are some communities that actually say, well, if you have socioeconomic uh, influences to you, that thing that you do may not actually be sin. I don't know if you know of that, but there are these kinds of, it's not so much so that we can like sort of decide for ourselves whether we've sinned or not mm -hmm. because we're anxious, so maybe that's not a sin, but rather I think it, it, your point of going to the great physician for everything is a really wonderful reminder to us mm -hmm. that in fact, if we're unable to tell whether something is sinful or an addiction or whatever, Jesus is there for us. And I think that was a wonderful reminder um, so I, what I'm trying to say is, I think what you've reminded me of is that it is very difficult for us to actually categorize the kinds of struggles that we're going through, and the answers are available to us. And, and I, I would add that I'm not sure we need to categorize, yeah, right. maybe you were implying that, yeah. right? but I did talk about the, the being sinned against as well, right? So, um, and it, it, yeah, it, it is just so intertwined that you really can't just say, well, this one's dealt with in church and this one's dealt with by the doctor. No. And I, I think that's um, uh, one of the... Uh, lack of integration or so so and and with counseling for example in the past church oh don't go see a counselor they're evil you just need the bible right. and now i'm seeing the pendulum's gone a little bit the other way it's like oh that's a medical problem go see a counselor it's like no it's all intertwined um but and and also to reiterate i i think it, i was emphasizing the concept of sins so we don't sure. actually need to be using the term um but uh unfortunately the holy spirit as the convicting, so we don't need to be making that decision and, and labeling, you know, is it sin or I think that's a false question, actually, is it sin or, um, I would always say it's and, and I did my um, uh, doctoral work on demonology and deliverance and the same questions come up, is it mental illness or demonization? No, get rid of the or and put an and, <laughs> it's usually both and. Yeah. Um, I should mention, by the way, that a, a longer version of this I, I did publish in the Perspectives in Science and Christian Faith. Does Providence subscribe to it, by the way? We do. Very yeah. good. So, <laughs> it's the, the December, article. I think it's available online actually too. So it was the December 2018 issue. The entire issue was devoted to um, addiction. So it's a longer version of what, and a slightly different, I mean, I did make some tweaks, but... Um, in a more academic format, if you're interested in references, etc., that's where you can find it. Um, I, I have to agree with Nicholas, and I was thinking very much the same thing. Um, just as we are all sinners, as as you have, I think, well explained, we are probably also all addicts, um, addicted to something. Mm -hmm. um, I loved your definition, or or your maybe not definition. I loved your connection of sin and seeking comfort apart from God. Uh, it reminded I think me, that could be a definition it, too. It reminded me of another explanation I have heard of adult um, of idolatry mm -hmm. as relying on creation for only what God should provide. Right. Um, and it, it linked that for mm -hmm. me mm -hmm. and also had me saying, is that actually a, a fair equivalent 
for addiction, uh, relying on mm -hmm. object creation, mm -hmm. whether, mm -hmm. uh, whether God's creation or man's creation, uh, but relying on for for what only God should be provided. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you for that. That there, there was just a lot to unpack in my own head on that one as we were talking about it. Um, I also very much value the idea of disease and choice, not either or, but both and. Mm -hmm. um, and. And dare I say, my type 2 diabetes probably fits that same definition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is disease, mm -hmm. but it is also a consequence of choice. Mm -hmm. um, and so looking at, at other addictions that way, um, as disease and choice holding hands, again, is going to have me processing for a while. So right. I love and, and when it gets me uh, so, so couple, couple of comments. First of all, um, I, I do want to. So, I, I, I think it's helpful for making the avoiding the us them dichotomy to think of addiction broadly. Mm -hmm. um, that we all seek comfort apart from God and creation, etc. Um, I do want to add though that there are some disadvantages to using the term too broadly because it can right. minimize right. Um, problems that people with extreme opioid addiction, right. etc., can. Uh, so I think as long as we have that caution in, you know, how we're using the term and not using it. Yeah. And then uh, secondly, your comparison with, you know, other diseases. Um, I don't know about so much consequence of choice, but there's elements of choice, perhaps, or components, or yeah. Right. And and again, as you know, some are um, uh, some are more uh, have certainly more of a biological component than others. So it's this continuum. Right. But yeah, there's it, there's always I would say there's always at least a minimal element of yeah. choice in any disease. And again, it's not about I should. Be clear, and hopefully this came across. It's not about victim blaming at all, um, but it's about just understanding the complexity. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. What was the journal that you mentioned? Perspectives in Science and Christian Faith, PSCF. I, I titled it according to the NIV, I believe. The I. I do not do what I want to do, something like that. <laughs> I've got to double check. It gets, uh, it gets a little dizzying, but I kind of like, I think the message and, and is uh, helpful. It's just a really great publication in general for <coughs> topics at the intersection of science and faith. And uh, yeah, past issues are freely available. So the most recent issues are reserved for members of the ASA and CSCA, but you should be easily able to find and past issues if they interest you, including the one where, yeah, that Janet mentioned. The more that you talk about this and teach about this, do you think that you are seeing more compassion as people gain more understanding? I feel like when, when I see, say, politicians or, or public figures, for example, speak about addiction, they're just saying the same sorts of things that people said 5, 10, 15 years ago and Sometimes I get dismayed when I don't see maybe the increased understanding and compassion of the time. Right, and, and I mean, the people I was quoting, you know, the, the, the secular people are the exception because what you hear in, in politics, etc., is primarily the medical model. It's this disease. Uh, I mean, they are, there is, I should, should qualify, I mean, there is more recognition of the societal aspects for sure. Um, but my concern with a lot of things is how much our churches unwittingly get buy into the, the secular uh, language and the secular terming of things. And we just assume that that's the way it is without questioning it. So I think this is a good example of where we can be, you know, always be questioning, okay, what is their understanding and how might it differ from our understanding? And, uh, having just talked about uh, people, worldviews, et cetera, <laughs> recognizing, you know, being careful about not just, and of course we see it in some of the uh, hot topic issues today, like uh, mad gender issues, et cetera. And Christians are buying into the, the language. And I'm not, I'm not even talking about what your views might be, but just the way things are understood and phrased. And some of which is, is, slurred politically and are not even accurate from a scientific point of view. So just always being being aware of that. So I think addiction falls into that category where 
um, yes, there is there's certainly more compassion, but the compassion is more from the uh, the treating a disease kind of compassion um, as opposed to the it, it being an example of how we all suffer and try and relieve that suffering, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, that's where I think churches could be more helpful. Thank you very much for the great presentation. Um, many years ago, when I searched for Alex in Hong Kong uh, with Jackie Bullying, who wrote the book Chasing the Dragon, um, that was when previous drug addicts said to me, um, that he was kind of pointing his finger on me that you can never understand as drug addicts. Um, it is very easy to get rid of drugs, um, but it is the hard issue that a lot of times drugs in addiction is just to kill, to minimize the pain. And the core problem is the, usually the natural, written from natural families. Um, so, it stimulated me to, to think deeper about addiction and, and the heart issue. So in terms of like, besides looking at, besides how church can help people dealing with sin, would you give any advice for the layman people can do, for example, to help um, people who are struggling with some external addiction. And on the other hand, sometimes I see a lot of people who may have addiction, but because they are religious, they have to, they feel obligated to hide their addiction mm -hmm. so that they need to look, because they need to be accepted in church, and mm -hmm. they need to look wrongly mm -hmm. by hiding and mm -hmm. denying. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. how can church as a whole, like pastors and lay, lay mm -hmm. Christians, mm -hmm. Oh. Um, so you've got a number of different concepts in there. Uh, first thing I just wanted to comment about uh, where uh, somebody says you can never understand. And I think I think that is we need to, if, unless we've experienced that same specific drug addiction, I think that's true to a degree that we cannot fully understand. And so I think that's certainly one way of being compassionate instead of the, oh, here I am, I'll rescue you kind of approach. It's like, help me understand. You know, so having the the dialogue, um, the uh, even talking about this today, hopefully, you know, um, just having the conversations is one way of increasing awareness. Right, that was one of the things I had mentioned is uh, just being more aware. Um, another interesting thing is like what we can learn from people who struggle with addictions is very often I've I've found that a lot of people are very open. To spiritual matters, um, and it's because you know the, the cliche about the hitting rock bottom, etc., um, as opposed to the sort of comfortable. Uh, you, you know, you talk about uh, Canadians being difficult to so-called evangelize, if you like, because just lives are too comfortable, and we've got it all, and don't have any problems. So. I think that's another, you know, the, the profit aspect of of the addict uh, is that uh, actually. Get I use that term, the person who struggles with addiction because it's not their identity. Anyway, um, the people who struggle, I think we can learn from them. So, so befriending people, uh, I think, is a really good thing. Finding commonalities. It's like, no, you're right, I can't understand. But I went through a struggle, whatever, when I was overeating or, you know, something, which you have to be careful with because you don't want to trivialize what, what they're experiencing, but finding some degrees of commonality um, can be helpful. Um, the, uh, you know, uh, preaching about uh, and having discussions in church uh, without even maybe lay using the terms addiction or sin, but just ways that, that we all feel anxious and all feel pain. So, so normalizing it and, uh, you know, helping us understand different ways that we can deal with it. Um, so yeah, all those things. I, and I, I don't have any, you know, if anyone else has any brilliant ideas or if anyone else has heard ways of this, where this has been done more successfully, um, I'm, I'm happy to hear. One, one quick question here. So the church often thinks that reducing harm 
And so that's not treating the addiction. It fosters sin. You want to comment on that? Um, uh, uh, sorry, where, where are you? Uh, are you saying that just from your own experience? I've heard many Christians uh, not support ideas like of harm reduction, uh, uh, safe injection right. sites, right. that kind of thing, yeah. because it fosters sinful behavior. <laughs> My simple answer is that it's complex. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so first of all, it's not only churches. I think that they are. You know, it is a very envelope. Um, the center where I work has a partner center that deals with harm reduction, um, and I've been ambivalent about it. So, it's it's not just churches that that think that there is a debate about um, the whole safe supply harm reduction kind of thing. Um, I mean, yes and no, uh, and it depends on how it's done. Um, you know, if, if you're saying in terms of fostering sin, if you recognize, okay, this is a temporary, temporary help um, on, on your way to getting other help, um, lesser evil, I'm sure I like that term either. Um, yeah, no, that, that's a, it's a, a good point. And I'm uh, just thinking how we could think more broadly about it as well. Um, because it's, it's kind of funny, um, well, not funny really, but uh, <laughs> um, a lot of times people with one addiction, they might come to counseling and, and they get over it, but then they just quickly substitute with another addiction. Um, you know, I've had people who are addicted to counseling or addicted to self-help books and addicted to support groups. And I'll tell okay, that's good, but let's look at why you do it. And I mean, it, it Churches, you know, addicted to good behavior, <laughs> addicted to, um, so, you know, you, you really got to look at what's, what's underlying and recognize that we all have multiple motivations, but sometimes the good addictions can be more difficult because the bad ones, so to speak, are, are more obvious. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, going back to the uh, person struggling with severe addiction as a prophet, because they, they, they're just showing the obvious of what is more hidden um, in all of us. And uh, you had mentioned earlier about how, um, you know, the cognitive dissonance, oh, I have this problem, but I'm in church. Well, churches should be places of welcoming the, the sinners. Um, and uh, I've heard... Uh, Anyway, the idea that you come, church, you come as you are, but you don't stay as you are. And that's for all of us. That's not just for people with obvious problems, right? So I think the idea of helping us to see the, the, the more subtle areas that we all struggle with, uh, and that's where we can learn from those who struggle with the more obvious ones, uh, um, and then there's the whole notion um, in some uh, Christian circles where, well, if you don't get healed, you don't have enough faith and you just need to pray more, um, as opposed to recognizing that most of the time, and, and I'm, I believe in miracles, but I think most of the time the miracle is a slow, painful process. <laughs> um, so again, uh, you know, having that sort of approach in our faith communities I think can be helpful. Well, this has been a good time together. Thank you so much for showing up and for coming and for bringing some wonderful comments and questions. Please join me in thanking you. Thank you.